So hi, my name is Joe Brockmeyer. I'm with the Apache CloudStack uh, Incubator Project. I work for Citrix full time uh, as a uh, open source cloud evangelist or something like that. But basically, I spend my time uh, working on Apache CloudStack or going around and talking about Apache CloudStack. Uh, luckily, I have absolutely no revenue responsibilities, so this is not going to be a sales pitch. I'm just going to try to give you the overview of what Apache CloudStack is, what it does. Um, I like to get the temperature of a room before the talk, so let's see how many folks are actually using cloud services right now or setting them up. Okay. Uh, how many folks are actually setting up your own infrastructure as a service clouds? How many people want to? Oh, I was hoping for more hands on that second one. Um, okay, well, maybe this will convince you. All right, I'm going to speed through then the characteristics, characteristics of clouds and things that I assume you all have a grounding on. So, for example, uh, NIST has a really good definition of cloud. Uh, I like to add something to it. So there are basically five characteristics of clouds that they subscribe to, which is number one, on-demand self-service. If you can't, you know, uh, plop down your credit card or your user credentials and uh, spin up a service without intervention of the IT department or something, it's not really cloud. Uh, broad network access, if I can't get to it, if you don't have a uh, decent network, um, it is not really cloud. Uh, resource pooling basically means that you know, you're know you using storage and network and compute uh, for multiple users or customers or whatever. You're basically taking that stuff and parceling it out to people um, as part of your cloud services in one way or another. Rapid elasticity. If I can't spin up 100 instances at once, I don't really consider it a cloud service uh, or take down services rapidly for that matter. Measured service. If I can't bill you or if I can't tell a department at the end of the much uh, end of the month how much it used, it's not really cloud. And finally, the thing that I add to it is API access. Um, you know, something like Amazon Web Services is nice. If you've ever used their web interface, though, you don't want to be provisioning everything through that. If they don't have an API to get to it, if I can't do things programmatically, it's not really cloud to me. It's not useful. Um, does anybody need an explanation of the different cloud service models? Everybody is, I'm assuming, Comfortable with the difference between IIS and all that, okay? Deployment models are pretty straightforward, public, private, and hybrid clouds. Anybody not uh, comfortable with those differences or those uh, terms? Okay. And being as I'm at ApacheCon, I'm assuming why open source does not really need a lot of discussion. Uh, anybody in here who's not convinced about open source? Okay, good. Um, Every once in a while you go to a, like a Linux event or something, there's a couple of people like, I, I'd like to hear the argument just for my boss. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I'm assuming everybody here can make that. So let's talk about CloudStack itself. Um, start with the CloudStack history. Um, this slide keeps getting longer every time I give this talk. Uh, funny how history works that way. Um, so uh, CloudStack actually started, its origins were in a startup called VMOps in 2008, which later became cloud.com. Uh, that was then released as CloudStack under the GPL v3 in May th 2010. It was one of those delightful open core projects at the time, so not everything was open. Some of it was open, some was not. Uh, the entire thing, uh, cloud.com was acquired by Citrix in uh, July 2011. And then it was entirely open sourced in August of 2011. Um, there was last year a little bit of contention when uh, CloudStack was proposed to Apache. Um, and I think uh, some conspiracy theories and things like that. What really basically happened was this. Cloud.com and then Citrix had customers on CloudStack who have production environments and they liked it and they were using it and they really didn't uh, they weren't confident in the bridge between Citrix had talked about trying to merge CloudStack and OpenStack, which was probably over, overly ambitious when that was thought up because basically you have a Python-based project which consists of you know, multiple discrete projects like Nova and, and Glance and Swift and things like that on one hand, and then you have a productized Java application that's basically an all-in-one turnkey solution um, and it was just overly ambitious thinking they were going to be able to merge these two projects. Uh, so eventually Citrix said, okay, we have people paying money for this and they'd like to see it continue. 
Uh, but as an open source project, people aren't flocking to Citrix to participate in a project governed by a single entity. Uh, and so they proposed it to Apache. Uh, it was accepted in April, uh, on April 16th. Uh, all the infrastructure took the summer to set up the infrastructure, get things like the Git repository set up, the mailing list working, all of that good stuff going. First release was in November, and uh, that was our first major release as an Apache incubating project. And our first minor release came out in February. I was silly enough to raise my hand for release management for the point releases. Um, and so this is the history so far. We're working on 4.1.0, and that should come out at the end of March or early April, depending on timing. Uh, I probably don't have to explain why we decided to go with Citrix, or I'm sorry, with, with Apache very much to this crowd. Uh, but basically, you know, Citrix looked around and, and they saw Apache as being the uh, organization with the best track history of governance and licensing and everything that was, um, you know, coincided with the project mission for CloudStack. And we've gotten a lot of community members who came to us who were already evaluating CloudStack and they came to us and said, you know, going to Apache did two things. Number one, we like the Apache, Apache licensing a lot more and we like the governance. We like the fact that Apache has you know, well understood governance compared to other projects. It's not quite as dicey as creating your own foundation and governance where we're not quite sure where it's going or who is really running the show. Um, so what is Apache CloudStack? Uh, this is kind of the marketing elevator pitch definition. It's basically just open source infrastructure as a service. Uh, we support multiple hypervisors. I'll talk about that, high availability. Uh, complex networking, firewalls, load balancing, VPN configurations in a multi-tenant environment. This is basically pretty much everything people want today when they're talking about a cloud environment, especially when you're talking about private cloud or setting up a public cloud. Specifically, it's a set of applications, uh, so we provide separation between tenants. We handle allocating the compute resources. Uh, we let users provision their own resources. We you know, make it easy for you to basically give users the keys to the amount of resources you want them to have. Um, it's massively scalable. We have customers like Zynga, or I should say Citrix has customers like Zynga, who are managing tens of thousands of physical hosts uh, using CloudStack uh, in, in production. Uh, and of course, it provides usage accounting. I'm gonna go through some of the top level features and most interesting things that CloudStack does. One of the first, uh, because most people encounter it first and everybody's usually impressed, uh, I describe this, um, uh, the CloudStack user interface. Uh, it's a web-based interface. Uh, I was at a Texas Linux Fest last summer and I was trying to describe it. I was trying to come up with a good metaphor and basically what I came up with you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like a kitten riding a unicorn over a rainbow. You know, it's just amazing. Um, this is not an actual screenshot. Um, but uh, the CloudStack UI, it's a reference implementation of the API. Uh, it's basically AJAX, uh, it uses JSP for localization, uh, and you can do all sorts of customizations. We have people who have taken and, you know, basically swapped out the logos and colors so it looks like their companies. We have customers who have basically rewritten the entire interface. Uh, and one of the concerns a lot of people have when they ask about, well, I can do this through the UI, but what about the API? The UI is a reference implementation, so basically there is nothing you can do in the UI that you can't do via the API. There may in fact be some things you can do easily programmatically with the API uh, or with CloudMonkey, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, but there is nothing you can do in the UI that you are hamstrung from doing uh, via the API. This is a screenshot of what it looks like. If we have time and the network cooperates, I'll do a quick demo um, of the UI, uh, or of CloudStack, actually. This is kind of a look at all of the components that CloudStack provides. So we have not only the CloudStack API, we also have an EC2 and S3 uh, API that works. If, if you need to use that, you can turn that on and use that as well. Uh, the self-service portal metering, uh, the dashboard for the admin, uh, we have load balancing built in, firewalls, VPN built in, storage, it manages your storage compute and network, and handles all your image management for templates and ISOs and so forth. Any questions so far? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? 
<laughs> that everybody is so quiet. Um, let me give you the quick architectural overview. So basically, CloudStack consists of a management server, uh, which stores all of its information in MySQL database. Uh, and then basically, you have your hosts, which are divided into zones, pods, and clusters. Uh, I'll talk about the secondary and primary storage and how those relate, uh, what they do. But this is kind of your basic architecture for a CloudStack install. Uh, I, people will talk about getting started with CloudStack. What would you need to get a reasonable install going? What would you need to just test it out on your laptop and so forth? But basically, the very I tell people the bare minimum for a CloudStack install to really get the full features is about three servers. You want two hypervisor hosts that are identical or you know, same RAM, same CPU, same hypervisor, and one management server with storage in the database on that. Um, we do support multiple hypervisors. We do KVM, Zen Server, Zen Cloud Platform, uh, VMware with vCenter, and also we do some bare metal with IPMI. Uh, so there are some folks who are basically just using CloudStack to manage bare metal servers. Um, We'll talk a little bit now about the, the designations within CloudStack. So a zone is kind of like an Amazon region or whatever. Uh, it's basically, it's just sort of a logical definition of a, a specific area, you know, that you're managing with CloudStack. Secondary storage is shared across the entire zone, um, whereas primary storage is gonna be cluster specific. Um, it has a single, you can only have one network model, advanced or basic, for a zone. You can manage multiple zones with CloudStack. You can ac actually manage multiple data centers, um, or you can set up multiple zones within a data center. Uh, so we do have customers, for example, who are using CloudStack uh, with, you know, they're managing multiple data centers with one install, essentially. A pod is sort of another logical definition. You can use that for like a rack or a row of racks or something like that. These all share a guest network. Um, you don't have to have homogenous machines within a, within a pod. Um, within a cluster, uh, you usually have a maximum of eight to 15 machines in a cluster and you do require the same CPU, RAM, and hypervisor on those, same networking type and everything. That's where you're going to migrate <laughs> That's the level at which you migrate machines. So for example, if you have an instance, if you have a host machine fall over, CloudStack will migrate your instance to another machine in the same cluster. So it won't migrate the machine outside of that cluster, okay? So let's talk about secondary storage real quick. Secondary storage is basically where you're going to keep your templates, snapshots, and ISO images. Um, this is, historically has been NFS. Uh, I talked, I was at Linux Conf AU uh, a couple weeks ago and I was talking to one of the folks who were using CloudStack and actually what they're doing is interesting. They're using, they're, they're using uh, NFS on top of ZFS and Solaris uh, with CloudStack. So basically they're using it because they wanted to do their own kind of snapshots and take advantage, uh, advantage of ZFS. Uh, so they're using it with that. Uh, but we also have support for Swift, GlusterFS, uh, Ceph, and some others. Um, so we're getting a lot of interest from the different storage uh, interest from the different storage players or users of those storage types, uh, giving us patches to support this. Um, it's managed by a secondary storage VM. So when CloudStack starts up, it'll actually start up a VM that manages shuttling images and ISOs back and forth and handling snapshots. Um, so basically, the management server will talk to it and it will do the work of all that. Primary storage, uh, we support NFS, iSCSI, CV CLVM. Uh, requires a shared mount point uh, for hypervisors can uh, mount and write to. Uh, you can, but I do not recommend this unless you really know what you're doing. You can use local storage, uh, but that basically means no high availability, no migration and so forth, okay? Um, any questions on that? All right. Uh, management server, we talked about this a little bit, but basically any ideas what, happen, what, what happens if the man to your hosts and your instances if the management server dies? The correct answer is absolutely nothing. Uh, they keep running, everything is fine. The only problem is you, you lose the ability to manage them at that point, but all of your running instances, all your jobs that are going, they're fine. Uh, you basically just need to kick the management server back up and you're good. Um, 
again, we've already covered the API stuff. That's all, uh, everything you can do through the UI, you can do through the API. Um, you have an unauthenticated API. Uh, if you're doing testing or development, uh, you can turn on an unauthenticated port 8096 and uh, basically send commands that way. Uh, authenticated uh, API is over port 8080, and you get your responses in XML or JSON, uh, depending on what you prefer. Um, one of the things people are interested in often is how does CloudStack allocate hosts? So basically, when I tell CloudStack spin up an instance, how does it choose to do that? It depends on what you want. Uh, CloudStack comes out of the box with a couple of defaults. So you have first fit, fit, uh, fit first and dispersal. So basically, you know, if you're worried about power consumption, you can go with a fill first allocation method. So basically, it'll fill up a host before you start allocating on another host. Um, you can go with first fit, where basically CloudStack just picks the first available host. Uh, or you can go with a dispersal, where CloudStack will try to evenly keep, you know, it'll spin up a VM on this machine, and then the next one, then the next one to keep the load balanced. Uh, if you don't like those, you can actually write your own. Uh, it does allow for over-provisioning, um, and you can also do um, allocation by operating system preference. So, for example, I live in St. Louis. We have a hosting provider there called Contigix that offers a service called MiraCloud that's built on CloudStack, um, and they offer three types. They basically offer KVM, Zen, and VMware. They charge a premium for VMware and Zen over uh, KVM. Um, and so you could, you know, they can basically decide where things are going to be provisioned by that. Um, you might want to provision, say, Windows hosts on VMware, uh, but provision Linux on KVM or something like that. Um, so it's really up to you. We talk about high availability. What we really mean by default is really fast mean time to recovery. Um, basically, if a host goes down, CloudStack, or an instance goes down, CloudStack will attempt to bring it up on another host or bring it back up again. Uh, it is not true high availability because the host will be down for a minute or so while it spins up another instance. Um, we also have a redundant router so that basically any time one of the hosts fails that has a router running on it, you're not, uh, you're not gonna lose connectivity or network because of that. CloudStack also, excuse me, also provides load balancing. Uh, we use HA proxy, uh, and basically you can set up sort of something like Elastic IP uh, on Amazon, or you can set up load balancing. You can go through and basically say, you know, send uh, traffic to these three instances that comes in on this port to this IP, uh, to this public IP. Uh, so you can use that, and you have a choice of source LB cookie or app cookie. Um, we don't support all of uh, HA proxies, uh, load balancing types. We just support the round robin source or lease connections right now. Snapshots, basically you can take snapshots or set up recurring snapshots. It's very easy to do. So basically you can, you know, set up a snapshot every day, every hour, every 15 minutes, whatever you need. Uh, for your instances, you can go in there and say, keep this many snapshots, or you can have uh, CloudStack delete snapshots after so many. Uh, and you can, of course, go in and delete things manually if you need to clear out space or just for whatever other reason. Uh, and you can also use snapshots to create new templates. So basically, spin up an instance from an ISO, uh, create your OS, and then take a snapshot, and you, now you have a new template for new instances. CloudStack networking gets very complicated, but basically CloudStack manages DHCP, VLAN allocations, firewalls, NAT port forwarding, routing, VPN, load balancing, all of that good stuff. Uh, it can also manage some physical network hardware. Uh, sadly, I've had no hands-on experience with this because for some reason Citrix has chosen not to buy me an F5 or any of these fun toys for my own use. Uh, not quite sure why. I, I hear they're a little expensive. Um, we have two types of networking in CloudStack, basic and advanced. Basically, basic is one physical network. Um, you know, everything has a unique private IP. You're not really pointing anything at a public IP. Advanced is for when you actually want to be doing things outside of your own firewall and attaching public IPs to things and getting into more complex networking setups. Um, 
has several networks uh, so that you can actually split these out for performance and so forth. Uh, but basically, there's a management network where all that traffic is related to the management server communicating to the hypervisors. Uh, the private network where all the system VMs are talking to one another and so forth. The public network, the guest network, link local for communication between the hypervisor and system VMs. Um, a lot of customers uh, find VLANs limiting, so we have implemented security groups, uh, which is basically using layer three isolation and using cloud stack to manage all of the, you know, uh, you know, what you can connect to and so forth instead of using VLANs. Um, default, of course, is deny traffic. So you have to basically open up everything that you want. Uh, one of the things that uh, some folks seem to find a little confusing with CloudStack is uh, domains, accounts, and projects. So basically, when you install CloudStack, you start with a root-level domain uh, where you can create administrator and user accounts. Um, if, you want, if you have customers or departments, depending on what you're using CloudStack for, you can create domains under that, and then you can create admins in that domain or regular users. Uh, and give them access to a certain, you know, you give the domain access to a certain amount of compute resources and storage and everything, and then they can administer it within that. Um, and then um, you can also use projects to organize time-limited uh, things. So, for example, if you're doing a um, proof of concept for your website or something like that. You can set up a certain amount of resources in CloudStack for that. You can put it under a project, and then when the project is done, when you've decided, okay, we don't need to worry about this anymore, you don't have to worry about going through and, and deleting 15 different instances or something like that separately, or remembering, well, which instance is associated with this and that and the other. You basically just whack everything in the project. Um, we support LDAP integration, so you don't have to worry about creating new users. Um, we don't do really complex role-based um, role access control in CloudStack right now. So for example, it's only as fine-grained as admin and user. There is no like, you know, well, this user has just this one admin permission, but not others or anything like that. Uh, there is some proposals to, to integrate more RBAC into CloudStack, but uh, hasn't made it in just yet. Um, the account system is very simple. Don't make it overly complicated. A lot of questions I get are from people who are like, well, I think it should work this way, so how do I do that? It's, it's just not like that. It, this is as complex as it gets. Um, usage accounting, basically, CloudStack keeps statistics for everything that you're doing within CloudStack and what you're using. Um, you can pull it into Excel or some billing solutions like uh, Amista and stuff like that. Uh, surprisingly enough, Citrix has a billing solution that they will sell you if you want to do that. Um, but basically, you can use that whether you're doing uh, public or private cloud to make sure that you're keeping a, a good track on what everybody's using. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. I don't know. I haven't heard any proposals on that. Why would you want multiple root domains? Okay. But I mean, as opposed to a domain domain, like what? Um, okay. So maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Uh -huh. uh, when you said you can have a domain that is root, uh -huh. um, if I understand that to imply that you can only have subdomains under that domain. Okay. Maybe you can go back a slide and uh, you can. Uh, so okay, I think I understand. So basically, within a domain, can I have a subdomain? Yeah, no, I think you. I think you elaborated on that one. But um, can you have multiple, multiple domains? Period. Uh, not within a zone, no. Not no, multiple. Not multiple root domains. You can have multiple domains. Yes. So, like for example, um, you know, we have a demo in, uh, demo instance, and I have a zonker.net domain under mm -hmm. that, and David has a, a GNSA. U.S. domain under that. Mm. Is that is yeah, it? Yeah, that, that's yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? I thought I saw another hand, but maybe not. Okay. Um, let's talk about trying Cloud Stack. So, if you actually want to test drive it, being an infrastructure as a service cloud, it is not trivial to set up. But there are a couple efforts to make it real easy to use 
you know, for initial impressions. One of the things we have is called DevCloud. It's a VirtualBox image. You basically download it, spin it up in VirtualBox. You can have this up and running in probably five or 10 minutes. There's been a fair amount of work that has gone into this. It's uh, very easy to get started with. There are a couple of downsides. You're doing nested virtualization in a VM. Um, it's not very speedy, you know. Uh, it probably will take probably about 10 or 15 minutes just to spin up its first system VMs and actually get cranking along. It's good for development purposes. We have a lot of developers who like to use this because they can basically push their changes in, restart the management server and see whether or not it's working, see whether or not they get errors. Um, but it's absolutely positively not for any kind of production use at all. Don't even think about it. Um, we also have some developers who run into trouble because they're trying to do real world, like they're trying to test DevCloud with like real world hardware and storage solutions and things like that. That's where it kind of falls down. It is not meant for that sort of thing. But it's easy set up. Basically, just install it. There's some instructions on the wiki. You'll log in on your machine, you know, localhost 8080 client, and uh, just, or you can just SSH in, and you can kind of tool around and get the feel for the UI and what it does and how it works. There's also a project called DevCloud KVM. Uh, this is basically uh, to take a Linux host running KVM and do a similar thing to DevCloud, but instead of running it in VirtualBox or something, you're just turning the whole box into a, you know, a DevCloud. And, and this runs a little bit faster and a little bit better. Um, I'm not sure how mature DevCloud KVM is. It's only been working, uh, it's only been in production, or I'm sorry, they've only been working on it for a couple of months, the developers who have been working on it. Um, but it's also listed on the wiki there. And uh, I will give them the slides and I'll put these on SlideShare so you can find the slides and go to these links and test them out later. There's also a CloudStack runbook for running basically a single server install. Um, David Nally, um, who some of you from Apache probably know, he's very active in our project. He wrote that, got a lot of fixes from the community. Um, you can find that at that link there. Um, and that focuses on CentOS with KVM. Uh, there's another run book. I think Sebastian is working on a run book uh, for Ubuntu and Zen. Uh, so there's a couple of efforts afoot to basically come up with a guide for the simplest production installs of CloudStack so you can get, get it started and, and get, it use, get used to it. Um, so one of the messages you may be getting is non-trivial to install and set up CloudStack. It's actually... I'm fairly technical, but not certainly probably not the most technical person in the room. When I started with Citrix last year, it took me about two days to get the first install up and running that worked well, uh, largely because I deviated from the install guide just a little bit thinking, oh, this doesn't matter that much. Turns out it matters. Um, CloudStack for the moment, for example, does not like IPv6. Uh, and so if it's on, things will not work mysteriously just because IPv6 is on the interface. Um, things like that. If you have another DHCP server running on the network, that will confuse the mighty heck out of CloudStack's management server in the instances, that's a bad thing. Uh, so little things like that, but it's actually not that difficult to install and get running, and if you're talking about setting up a production cloud compared to other platforms, it's actually fairly easy to get going once you get going. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. That's my contact info. I'll give you, uh, if you have any questions or anything, um, I can also try to get into the demo instance and see if we can do a quick demo or at least show you through the UI real quick. Uh, but did anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, let me see if I can... Uh, get a good demo going here. Yay, network.
There we go. All right, so this is sort of like screenshot I showed you earlier, and if we have time, I'll show you both the main admin interface and then a domain user or admin interface. So this is sort of the dashboard that you get when you log in. It will show you real quick any major alerts. These have been sitting for a while. Um, system capacity. Um, this is actually, yeah. Yeah, we're waiting to have more public IP addresses allocated from the corporate uh, powers that be, so that's kind of why we're, we're getting the red there. Um, but basically, you'll get a quick look at your storage and your IP allocation and all that right here. Um, go down here, you can see all of the instances that are currently running in the entire zone, um, and then you can basically get into one of the instances and see what's going on there. Um, quick click, and this is a little slow over a long haul network and a on a Wi-Fi connection like the one we have here, but basically you'll pop up a console and you're right into the instance without having to SSH into anything or do anything uh, weird. So it is not the smoothest, uh, bestest uh, virtual console I've ever seen, but it, it does the job. Uh, and it's perfectly usable if you're doing something like installing an operating system over the network so you can see everything as well. Uh, any questions on this so far? All righty. All right. Uh, but you can get in here and kick the machine, kill it, um, basically change the password, all that good stuff. Storage will give you an overview of all the different storage volumes and snapshots and all that good stuff that you have here. Um, get in and manage that. Uh, network, you can get in here and you can set up your load balancing, you can set up your firewalls and everything through here. Um, templates, this will show you all the templates that are available to the entire system. Um, It's also where we keep the ISOs and everything. It's very easy to register a new template or ISO. You basically just fill out a little wizard, add a couple pieces of information, and you're good to go. So, like, if you want to, uh, you know, a new version of Debian comes out and you have the URL, just pop it in here and you're good to go. Users can start spinning up instances using that. All right, there we go. Events, I hate this icon because it makes it look like it's a calendar or something. This is actually a log. Um, this basically will show you all of the most recent events that are interesting. Um, or you can look at the most recent alerts. Um, so. Accounts is pretty much what it says on the 10. You can come in here and manage all of your system accounts for the entire, for the entire zone. Um, and then here's your, your domains. So basically you can set up all kinds of domains under here. And you can limit resources by domain. So let's say um, I have 10 hosts and I could spin up 100 instances in this CloudStack install. I can limit a domain to say 10 instances. So they can only, you know, this way you can give users or departments or whatever access to a very limited set of resources so that you don't have to worry about them uh, you know, it's not the same thing as giving the keys to the kingdom in VMware vSphere or something where they can spin up as many VMs as they want. Um, this way, they can only spin up as many VMs as you allow them to. Infrastructure, you can get an overview of all the zones, pods, and everything that's running under here. You can add hosts and clusters and whatnot. Um, don't really think I have any real project set up. Let's see what we've got here. Yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, we haven't really done much with this one. So, but here you can limit the amount of accounts and everything to a project, for example. Um, global settings, you can get in here and basically change all the major settings you would want to, for example, turning on the EC2 and S3 APIs and whatnot. Um, and then service offerings, 
folks are familiar with like the uh, medium EC2 instances, things like that, def basically the different size instances you get with Amazon and whatnot, this is the same thing. This is where you set up the type of instances that you want to give people. Um, so, and it's pretty easy to define a new instance. Um, I used to use, I used to work for a hosting company that used OpenVZ, or I'm sorry, Virtuoso, which you know has its cousin OpenVZ. And setting the amount of CPU and the amount of, uh, amount of RAM and things that people could have with an instance was crazy because you had to do it in some weird bean counter, uh, like weird strings instead of just saying, give this four gigs of RAM. You know, it was, it was some weird format. Um, yeah. I'll show you starting up an instance real quick. So basically, it's just a six step process. You go in here and say, okay, I want to create a instance with a template. Um, you can have private templates, you can have community templates. So, you know, if you're in a zone and you, you create a template and you want to share it with people, you can do that. Um, or you can choose not to. You can, as a user, you can create a template that's not public. Um, so let's say that, uh, I want to start that one up. Go over here, I'll say a small instance. I'm not going to get a data disk offering with that. I'm not going to do anything fancy with the network. Uh, give it a quick name. And it'll take a, sec a couple seconds, maybe a minute to spin up, and there you go. And of course, you can do all that via the uh, via the command line with Cloud Monkey. You can do all that. In fact, I'll uh, <coughs> one of the things I've never gotten used to presenting is trying to run a trying to work with the mouse between one display I can see and one that I can't. All right. All right, there we go. So basically, CloudMonkey um, Cloud Monkey is a shell or a set of command line tools that you can use to work with CloudStack. Um, all you need to use this is basically your user secret API key and your user ID key or whatever. Uh, if you, again, if you've used Amazon Web Services, you've used something similar. Uh, you put that in your configuration file, and then all you have to do is start this up and associate it with a specific instance. Um, and so mine is associated with a demo instance. And I can just say, you know, list, and it'll give me, you know, all the type of uh, things that I can list. So I'll say list ISOs. And it will give me, you know, a list of all the different ISOs that are available. Uh, or I can say list sure. Uh, list instance groups or whatever. Uh, create you know, any of these things from the command line. So basically, I don't even have to, you know, pull up a web browser to manage this. It's a little more typing, but it's also a command line tool. You can use it programmatically, so you can basically set up scripts to do all these things. Any questions on that? Okay, that's pretty much all I've got. So uh, thanks very much. <laughs>